Hey guys, Tim here. Due to the virtual nature of our interview, some parts may be difficult to understand or hear, but they resolve quickly. We apologize for the connectivity issues. We also recommend listening at 1.5 times speed. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the Medical Muse podcast. Discover the humanistic aspects of physicians and scientists as they describe their career paths and any advice they have for current medical students. Each episode, we interview a new guest and discuss the future of the field. This is The Medical Muse. Hey everyone, we have Dr. Norman Rose here with us today, the former president of American College of Osteopathic Surgeons. Dr. Rose has contributed numerous publications, has served as a residency director, and has had many other several achievements throughout his career. We are very fortunate to have him as a faculty member for us at Nova Southeastern University. Dr. Rose has been a tremendous leader in the field of surgery, and we thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. So Dr. Rose, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, um, I've had a wonderful career, and uh, I love my teaching, and I can say that uh, I will continue teaching until I can't anymore, or they don't pay me, or, I, or they don't want me or uh, I get some kind of condition like Alzheimer's disease and can't do it anymore. But uh, it's always been fun for me and I've done it now for close to 60 years. And so it's, uh, it's in my blood, so to speak. Okay, so you've been teaching for 60 years. Yes. My first class, actually, I started teaching when I was in medical school itself because I had a good background in histology and embryology. So the pathologist wanted me to run his lab. So that was in 1960. It was my first teaching experience. Wow, that's amazing. That's a long time ago. <laughs> it is a long time ago. Um, so how long have you actually been practicing medicine? I graduated in 1963 and then uh, had an internship and surgical residency at Des Moines General Hospital in Des Moines, Iowa. That's when we had our own osteopathic hospitals and our own surgical residencies. Uh, you couldn't really get any allopathic training except a smidgen here or a smidgen there. You might run up to Mayo Clinic and sit in the gallery and kind of look over and see what they were doing as far as new procedures. Of course, we didn't have uh, YouTube to look up and see uh, actual operations back then. And you were lucky if you got a, a, a movie of one or two of the surgeries that were going on. So uh, it was a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Do you want to kind of reverse a little bit? Let's go with um, what, what made you want to go into medicine in the first place? Well, that's an interesting story, and I hope uh, you have time for it all. But we have as much time as we have time. Basically, uh, it started when I was a uh, kid, and it was uh, just uh, during World War II, which is probably before even your parents were born, and uh, my mother was ill. We went to our family doctor in uh, Brooklyn, New York, and we lived in the Brownstone. We lived upstairs, his office was downstairs. So she was not well, and I, she took me because, uh, well, I wasn't gonna be left alone. I was only about five years old then, six years old. We went to the office and uh, uh, sat in his little waiting room, and then he called my mother in to his private her examining room, examined her. And uh, she came out and she had a handful of medicine that he had given her. And uh, very nice gentleman, kind of pudgy, just a good old family doc, so to speak. And so on the way out, there was a little cigar box. My mother took out a dollar, put it in the cigar box. And I did and I said, what's that for? She said, I'm paying the doctor. Here she's got these pills. He never sent out a bill. Never asked for payment, whatever you could afford. And I said, my, he's a wonderful man. He gave you all that medicine and you're going to get well. 
So that was the start of saying, gee, this is what I want to do. Well, when I was 12 years old then, I ruptured my appendix. And back then, that was a pretty serious thing. I got a terrible scar to prove it. And they left the wound open, of course, because it was all infected and full of pus. And so uh, it was a situation where I was ill and uh, my father decided we had moved to a housing project. He decided he's going to take me back to old Dr. Friedman to check me out. This and was the same we, doctor from yep, before? Same okay. doctor. We go and we went by trolley car. Oh God, the bumps hurt. Because I had peritonitis at the time. Oh man. Out there, he checked me over. He says, no, he's got appendicitis. You got to get him to the hospital. The old man sprung for a cab, but the cab hit a lot of bumps too. So I know what peritoneal signs are. Got to the hospital, of course, they got me to surgery. But after I got well and I was in the hospital for about a week with antibiotics and everything, I said, my God, they saved my life with surgery. That's what I'm going to do. And I made up my mind at 12. That's what I was going to do. And so I was very, very fortunate to be in New York because uh, they kind of moved you along according to how you were progressing. So I skipped a grade in public schools. I skipped a grade in uh, junior high school. I skipped a grade in, I did high school one year less. Uh, I did college in three years. So I had my doctorate when I was 21, went on 22. Holy so God, that's God. about the age you guys start now. <laughs> yeah. So that's why I've had such a long career because uh, I kind of cheated. I went to summer school and worked and whatnot. But, uh, I don't think me and Daniel are doing enough. <laughs> yeah. I'm a decade behind you, Dr. Rose. <laughs> but you know, it, it was something I, I knew I wanted and I knew what direction I wanted to go. And then it was a matter of making up my mind. Um, where are you going to go to school? What you going to do? Mm -hmm. You know, it was nice to escape Brooklyn, which I was very happy to do. And when first, did you went do off, first went off to Marietta College in Marietta, Ohio. And I had a partial scholarship there. While I was there, we were beta, 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 and then many of you may know that that's the biology honorary. Uh, we had a, a, a speaker come. Um, he was the, uh, the president of the Kirksville College. And he was visiting and gave a talk. And sounded interesting. <clears throat> With him was a surgeon. And uh, I said to the surgeon, uh, well, here I'm at college. Can I observe some surgeries? He says, certainly. So I started observing him doing surgeries. And uh, thought that was pretty cool. So I figured I'd better investigate this. Believe it or not, uh, I ended up visiting the Edgar Casey Institute. You may not be familiar with him, so he was kind of like a psychic. Virginia. Like what? A psychic, somebody that could kind of foresee things. What was interesting is he had all these letters that A.T. Still and him have been corresponding. And A.T. Still was explaining the philosophy. To him. I read all those letters. Then I got the books. Then I got A.T. Still's books. And then I started understanding the philosophy. Of course, you guys probably have not had my osteopathic surgical philosophy lecture at this point. But I said, you know, I like this. I like the, I like the ideas that I get. I like the thinking. And I know that I could be a surgeon and still be a DO. Mm -hmm. Okay. It was interesting because I had gotten the scholarship to Western Reserve for a PhD MD. At that time, I didn't know if I wanted to teach. And what happened after that? But finding out that philosophy, I was sold. 
I was told, and it's, it's, it has done me well for all these years. It has really done me well. For listeners who don't know much about osteopathic medicine, do you want to give a brief kind of um, summary of what that philosophy means to you? Well, there were so many things I could take from it. And what, what I appreciated was not only getting that information there and when I went to school, um, but I had the opportunity, one of, our, one of my rotations out of Des Moines for psychiatry was at the, the Still Hildreth Sanitarium in Missouri. You take a month there, a rotation. Um, we don't have sanitarium, so to speak, anymore. But the individual that was running it was an elderly man. And it was A.T. Still Jr., his son. And every day, we did manipulations, actually twice a day on all the patients. But at lunch, you could sit down with him and you could talk about the philosophy of what his father was doing. So uh, I, I am probably one of the last that have had that kind of opportunity. And what impressed me, and especially reading A.T. Still, what impressed me was an understanding of anatomy and physiology, an understanding that any change in any anatomical part, whether it be on a cellular level or on an organ level, alters that physiology. And as that physiology is altered, the patient has a change and develops a symptom. And that symptom is what the patient comes in and talks to you about. And if you understand and can trace it back to that anatomical part that has now changed because of a pathology, then you can understand the whole disease mechanism. And he was so correct. He was also so correct, which we're proving now that, uh, well, from a surgeon's standpoint, it was great because I could then perceive what I had to correct to bring the patient back into a physiologic balance as close as I could. And that's the beauty of surgery. That's the art of surgery. That's the imagination you have to have. If you don't know your anatomy and physiology, you can't accomplish getting that done. We also talked about in great deal that, and we've heard this over and over, I'm sure that within our bodies, we really have everything we need as far as medicines that normally keep us healthy. And when we run out of that medicine, so to speak, or we alter that medicine, uh, then we come down with a problem. Uh, it may be a genetic aspect to it, in which our anti-cancer medicine is run out. And therefore, we develop a cancer. So now in modern surgery, modern medicine, what are we striving for? We're looking at all the genomic aspects of cancer. And we've made great strides in breast cancer and a whole other areas to identify what is missing. We just haven't figured out totally how to get it reversed, that, that change that gene. Now that you got CRISPR, in which you can change gene, we are on the threshold of being able to identify people that are going to be prone to various cancers and alter that so they don't get the cancer. That was A.T. still thinking, again, what, is, what went wrong in the body? What medicine got left? What immune system failed? And how can we correct that? I mean, you're talking 125, 150 years ago. And so all those things intrigued me as far as the philosophy. On top of that, having another tool. It was a tool not only diagnostically, because we used to really do a good examination as far as visceral somatic changes. 
but also therapeutically being able to do manipulation. So on patients that would come in and uh, back to one of our faculty had a little problem and I checked her over and I checked her back and I said, I think you uh, may have a gallbladder problem. Didn't have much history, but she got an ultrasound. In fact, I did the ultrasound to do that class. And yeah, she's got gallstones that I could feel the, the change <clears throat> that were there. Well, you, it, it, it's something that's not used enough because you've got all the technology on top of that. But also, you have to remember that I may correct the pathology by taking out the gallbladder, but I haven't corrected the somatic changes until I manipulate that patient and correct it. And so my patients ended up getting ONT to correct that visceral somatic and correct that thoracic spine where they had that relationship and they felt better quicker because they didn't have that ache in that right infoscapular area. So it, it was it, the totality of what you can practice and the philosophy uh, it's it's so much different than allopathic medicine. It would be tremendously difficult to get all these concepts across. We have a mixed faculty now, and uh, I try to explain to them what makes us different and why we should be thinking along those lines. And they've gotten to appreciate it a lot more than they did before. Um, in fact, some of them wanted me to show them how to do some of this stuff. But, uh, just about on all my major surgeries, just about all of them had cervical problems after surgery because the anesthesiologist would paralyze them and ram their neck back while they're in, intubating them. And they all ended up with cervical spine problems because the neck never moved that far, you know, pushing it all the way back. Uh, I had techniques uh, that I'd use, sitting techniques for the patient post-operative correct the cervical spine, which made them feel a lot better and they breathed a lot better and overall required less pain medication. So all those are, you know, you think about all these other things that you guys have tools. Um, we don't use them as much anymore as far as diagnostics, uh, basically because of uh, the technology. <laughs> and of course, that sets up some irritation to me at times because I get a call from the resident. And, uh, and he says, well, I looked at the CT and uh, such and such. I said, well, did you examine the patient first? No. And that's you guys. Yeah. That's what you do. You're on the way into the hospital. You got an acute abdomen. Tell them, get the CT. I'll look at it later. I've had personal experience with attending doctors myself, in which they looked at the CT before they examined me. I told them exactly what was wrong with me, but you know, they, had to, they had to get the CT anyway. I hope that answers your question. I know it was a little long. No, no, no. That was, thank you for your answer. Um, that was very, very uh, enlightening. Thank you. Um, so coming up as an osteopathic surgeon, uh, what were, I think you touched on, on some of that, um, in your answer, but, uh, what were some of the biggest hurdles that you had to go through, um, whether it was through residency or, or afterwards, what were some of the biggest challenges you faced and, um, how did you overcome them? Well, I guess I could start out in my residency. We didn't get paid very much <laughs> and I couldn't afford journals, for example. Um, and I knew my chief was going to pimp me on articles and stuff because he was an avid reader. And after about two or three months, I figured out, boy, this, this is a problem. I, I can't answer his questions. And uh, I usually got to the hospital between 4.35 in the morning, make rounds before him. And I said, well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go to his mailbox and take the journal. 
I took the journals and I read them and then I put them back in the box. And I looked brilliant from then on. So that was number one hurdle. <laughs> but, but it, you know, it, it, you have to you have to stay ahead. And I tell you guys, you know, when you do your rotations or if you're doing uh, auditions and stuff, find out what articles are written by the people that you're going to be working with and read them. And then you can spit out this information and you have a better chance to get residency because you're really up on their material. So, uh, and you can do that because you can go online and get everything now. That was number one. In the residency itself, of course, we didn't have an 80 hour week. We had, you know, whatever it took. And it was uh, sometimes it was about on duty in the hospital every third night or every fourth night. And so that's tough on you and it's tough on your family and so on. Um, so it, it was arduous. The training philosophy was a little different and they, they expected you to really observe. And they only give you, gave you the first few years only bits and pieces of an operation, not the whole thing. And uh, one of my trainers uh, didn't believe in talking in the operating room because he felt it spread germs. And he might be correct to some extent that there's that potential. So you really had to watch what he was doing because he wasn't talking. You know? He might ask a question here and there, but he wouldn't really talk or through the procedure. Uh, that would make it hard because then you don't know what he's deliberately making sure that he's doing that he wants you to know. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So would you come up with a question list afterwards and be like, doctor, this is what I noticed. Why did you do it this way? Or No, you didn't. Uh, then I'd be afraid of it showing my stupidity by asking those questions. <laughs> to obtain additional knowledge, as I said, it was difficult. I, Went to Israel uh, to learn a little bit more about hysterectomies. Of course, there was a guy doing them there in about 20 minutes, and I figured out how he was doing them and why. And you kind of run anywhere you could. And uh, UCLA at that time was not DO anymore. I mean, the uh, the uh, LA County Hospital wasn't DO. It was they had gone over to the MDs at that time, but I still could run over there and still pick up some new stuff. Uh, my chiefs were pretty good because, you know, I could go away to a conference and come back and say, you know, this, uh, they're starting to do this thing called angiography. <laughs> and, you know, we can look at the vessels, we can you know, find aneurysm, we can find occlusions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Instead of, you know, trying to figure it out the old fashioned way with physical diagnosis. <laughs> he said, well, what's going to take? I said, well, we can start out with a long needle and do trans, trans lumbar uh, aortograms. All right, order one. Yeah, let's go do it. And they let me go do it. And I said, well, we got to now get some catheters. We made our own catheters. Now you've got interventional, you know, radiologists. We don't even get near that. But well, we were, I was doing all of the uh, the angiography, including coronary angiography, way back when. That's just all the general. My general surgery was everything, guys. General surgery now is not that. You had to learn everything. We did tonsils. I did tonsils, C-section, pinned hips, took kidneys, did my cystos, did all the cancer general surgery, renal cancer surgeries, cracked chests, new vascular surgery. Pacemakers came out, I put in pacemakers. The first Was there time. ever a procedure that when it came up, you're like, oh no, not this time, <laughs> that you didn't like to come across? No, I, I loved all the new stuff. When the staplers came out, my residency, I 
convinced my chiefs that, you know, the hand sewing is great. We did a lot of that. We can use all these staplers, especially on low, you know, sigmoid, low sigmoid uh, cancers where we might be able to avoid a colostomy by using the new end-to-end -end staplers and things like that. So I always loved the new stuff. Um, the first Mobin Uden umbrella, the pulmonary emboli, the plicate the vena cava, I put in by reading the directions. <clears throat> so, you know, you could do that then. You can't get away with that now, but you could do that. Um, I started doing laparoscopy early in my career. So when they came out with the, you know, doing gallbladders and stuff, well, I ran off and did my pig and came back and started doing it. The first year I did it, it very, well, I was the first one in Iowa, but nobody else was doing them. I did 500 gallbladders for one year. Back then they paid a lot better than they pay now. So <laughs> it makes a big difference. So it's always been fun to me to keep on learning, to, to get into the new stuff. That, in fact, I guess that's why they dumped the ultrasound on me to teach faculty how to do ultrasound and you know I didn't I never learned ultrasound except you know as it came along uh, especially to do it so all of these things guys if you want to have fun to me it's been fun it's been fun to study it's been fun to learn it's been fun to get on, in on new stuff um, that's part of the excitement and you know, surgery is continually changing. Probably at least 50% of the procedures I did 50 years ago are not being done anymore. Plus they've got other procedures that have replaced it. And if you don't, haven't kept up, you're not, you're not really taking care of your patients. The other thing is you gotta know your limitations. And um, I was very, very fortunate. Uh, you know, I did all these surgeries. But I knew that if I had the specialty training, I probably would be doing them a lot better. So over the years, I ended up with a group of 22. They were all former students, by the way. But I had sent them away to bring back some. So um, one of my residents I sent to the university uh, Nebraska, just for urology. He came back and I said, it's all yours. You, you can have it all. There's another one away, there's Sloan Kettering. Um, came back, and I said, all the Whipples, they're all yours, baby. <laughs> I'll be very happy not to do those ever again. Uh, orthopedics I got out of by sending one of my um, students to University of Tennessee, became a good orthopod, brought him back. My GI guy, uh, not only at UCLA, but sent him to Japan, brought him back. Didn't have to do any of that. And um, Dr. Pandeya, Nehmerindu Kim Pandeya, he was a surgical resident of mine, sent him to Karolinska, plastic surgery, because we didn't have plastic surgeons very well, then. brought him back. All yours, baby. So I got out of a lot of things by turning it over to my former students and made my life a lot easier. I had, to, again, three other partners besides myself in general surgery. Of course, they didn't do tonsils. I had to teach them how to do C-sections and hysterectomies because I was still doing those. You know, I had a variety. Um, you guys cannot imagine tonsil days. Tonsil days back in the early 60s is when they would bring in the whole family. And you would be doing 20 to 30 TNAs in one day. And it was 25 bucks and that included your lab work. <laughs> and it was with ether. And if you walked down the hall or you were in the grocery store, everybody knew what you did because you breathed all that ether and you're still putting it out and people could smell ether all the time. Oh, it, it was crazy. It was great. It was great. It still is, guys. Oh, you're fortunate. You're in a great era.
I'll go on and on for hours if you want, but that gives you a gist. It sounds like you kind of you kind of assembled and trained your own little dream team to, to <laughs> run your surgeries. Absolutely. And I'll give you another great example. I have one resident that uh, uh, he was good, but he didn't have an imagination. And, you know, in general surgery, you have to have imagine how you're going to put things back together. You can't always do it the same way. It just doesn't work that. And I told him, I said, but you, I said, you can mimic me like perfectly, but you can't change. You have to do it the same way. And I said, you know, there's one type of surgery that should be perfect. He says, what's that? I said, open heart surgery. Really? Because then we didn't have very many open heart surgeries. I said, yeah, they, they, they have to do everything in a very systematic way, setting up the pumps and the bypasses. So it doesn't change. It's, it's always the same. Said, well, where can I get to? I said, I, you know, we, we don't have, we don't have uh, our surgery. I said, let me give a call to Cleveland Clinic. Got on the phone with the director of the heart program. And I explained my situation. And he says, you know, we've never taken any DOs. We don't have any. This is back in the mid to late 60s. He says, but this is a fellowship and I'm not restricted. How many fellows or what fellows I can take? He says, yeah, I think we'll take it. So Jerry Lamar was the very first DO fellow open heart surgery at Cleveland Clinic. And I brought him back. And I brought back two more that I sent there and we had opened up our own open heart program. Holy cow. And then we did our own training. Uh, it was one of the first open heart programs the profession had. Then again, where I trained, I guess I ought to tell you, Moyne General was the first general surgical residency in the osteopathic profession. My trainers were trained by MDs, Halstead. Well, Dr. Halstead, the Halstead procedure, mm -hmm. uh, go on. That's who trained my trainers. You can imagine the radical surgery that they were used to doing. Halstead was famous for the radical mastectomy. That's another is he the here. doctor that's rumored to be the reason why residencies are, have such long hours, or is that a false rumor? I don't know, but he was a he was a coke addict. That yeah, that's the one I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, he was the coke addict. Yeah, he and so he was up all the time. Mm -hmm. and my trainer would say um, he he start wake up at midnight and go over to the hospital and says we're going to start the surgery schedule now. Get the residents in, in here. <laughs> and he would start his surgery schedule for the next day at midnight because the patients were already in the hospital. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. So, what are the problems? All right. So, the obstacles of getting the training was always there. The, um, the obstacles, as far as, um, again, being restricted before they opened the doors in the allopathic hospitals, which was fine by me, to be honest with you, because I was teaching in the chair of the department and was teaching at my university. So all the GPs that I had as students that were in the small towns were sending me cases because they weren't sending them to MDs at the time. Well, I had a, you know, my, I would be averaging four to five majors a day which you don't see anymore. And so that was a blessing. When I was in residency, I heard that uh, one of the MD hospitals was putting on this clinical path conference every Tuesday. And uh, I had called the surgeon that we had invited over to do a surgery once and asked him, gee, just on an educational basis, can I, can I come? 
And he, and he says, well, you know, it's just for education. And he approached the board and he had a fight in order to get permission to let me sit in on the damn thing. Now, lo and behold, they were using the cases from the military, from the, the military pathology unit. And I was getting the same cases the week before. All of a sudden they said, we've got a brilliant, this guy is brilliant. Because I had the answers before I sat down there on Tuesday. It's just like stealing the journal. Staying ahead of the game. So, it, but the doors didn't open for later on. And I was disappointed when they did open, to be honest, because a lot of people I thought were true blue DOs thought they were enamored uh, referring to allopathic, you know, surgeons. And I had to be running to five hospitals instead of one. So that, uh, that, that definitely was a headache. And of course, probably the most difficult thing for me in my life, when uh, I was operating, and uh, actually I was doing a laparoscopic cholecystectomy, and I was putting the clips on the cystic duct and the cystic artery, and the stapler didn't seem to work properly. And I said to the nurse, I think it's a defective stapler. Give me another one. And she did. And that one didn't seem to work. Then my resident leaned over and said, Doctor, put it in your other hand. What? Put it in your other hand. And it worked. And I had not realized that I had such severe carpal tunnel syndrome that I did not have any more strength in my hand was the stapler. I said, how long have you known that I've had a problem? And he said, well, the ratchets on the Coker and the ratchets on the Kellys, you know, you usually could get it up to the third or fourth ratchet. I've been getting it up to the second. Really? So I had the uh, the carpal tunnel operated, the ulnar nerve operated, but the hand never came back. Stayed numb. So God decided that I wasn't going to be doing surgery anymore. Nobody wanted a numb hand surgeon with no insurance company. All the insurance being having a numb hand. And that's what got me down to Florida. I said, okay, thank you, Lord. You made the decision. I'll just fall back on my teaching and if I'm going to teach, I'm not going to freeze my butt off anymore. I'm going down to Florida, <laughs> leaving Iowa. <laughs> when you were running the um, the residency programs, what would you look for in an applicant? No, everyone has special characteristics. And, and, and sometimes it's... Uh, you would have the opportunity to work with them as a student or an intern. Some of them, uh, you can see, had beautiful hands. Uh, I named half a dozen that I said, man, you know, you did that meticulously and really looks good and you did a really good job. So you could see the talent there. You could see some of them with the imagination, you could see some with drive. And then you get, you know, you get a different one every once in a while. I was interviewing, uh, and it was a, a guy that had been in practice, in uh, general practice, for about uh, 15 years already. So he was you know, in his upper 30s. Two, three, three, in fact. And he's applying for the surgical residency. I said, but you know, you've been a, a, a GP. You know, I got all these young studs out here. That all and they can probably practice a lot longer than you. You know, I've always wanted to be a surgeon, but I was bringing up a family and I had to, you know, I figured I'd go in general practice. But I never gave up my hope. And they said, well, what makes you so special that I should be taking you over the rest? And his answer was really worthwhile. He says, you know, I've got the enthusiasm and the ambition of a 21-year-old, maturity, 
it is in 48 years. So, you know, you're going to get a shot. And he turned out to be great, ended up in a small town. And he, he loved all the things that we were doing because he could do it in a small town, tonsils and everything else. He just had a ball. Fortunately, he was also servicing some smaller hospitals in one winter night. Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin, in the small town he worked out of. He got a call to go to another small hospital and steal off the road. So I lost a few of my guys. He was great. Others, you know, you just kind of get the feel. And, uh, it turned out fantastic. And you, got to, and you could see that they could do other things. For example, Dan Waters, who was also an open heart surgeon. Uh, I'm just finishing. Uh, fourth novel that he's written. Oh, wow. And so, you know, uh, he's just retired. He was an open art surgeon in, in uh, Iowa. But now, I mean, he, he writes beautiful, uh, beautiful books. I mean, they're had quite an imagination <laughs> as far as writing these books. They're very intriguing. So, there's diff different things that you look at different people. Of the, the hard parts you guys have now, especially with this COVID thing, is less audition, so you have less chance for them to see you one on one. Yeah. You have less chance uh, as far as interviewing because you have to do it this way by Zoom or whatever. Mm -hmm. They really can't get a feel and whatnot. So you know, it, 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 you've got more of a burden. I'm optimistic is, about that actually because. Our competition also has the same limitations. So I'm not too convinced it's gonna hurt us, but I could be mistaken. Well, you know, we lost a lot of programs that gave preferential treatment. And granted, my residents have gotten fellowships the last uh, seven, eight years at really good places that I wanted at UCLA and uh, with breast surgery and, uh, and a bunch in uh, critical care and trauma. They've got good fellowships. Um, but at the same time, uh, it's, it's, it's been more difficult to get the general surgery. Because the competition is, it, it, there's so much of it, not only from the allopathic profession that's here in the country, but from your foreign medical graduates. And uh, it puts an extra burden. So, yeah, you guys, uh, you have to beef up your CV. You got to try to get your posters shown and do some of your whatever research you can and develop a poster or write a paper. Um, you're going to have to get, I noticed my writing of recommendations is a lot different than it used to be because I have to really explain why I think this person is so different and special because they're not going to have the opportunity to sell themselves as much mm -hmm. before. So your recommendations have to be really spot on and special. Your, your personal statement needs to really reflect who you are because now program directors have to read that personal statement. They're a little insight. So you got to work on those. Uh, I hope that helps you as far as if you're thinking about getting a residence. It's a whole different ballgame. And uh, I have faith in you guys. I know how hard you work. You know, you're like Avis. You try harder to prove yourselves and whatnot. You're, you're just uh, in there digging away. And I dearly love it. So... Uh, I guess just adding on to that, um, you mentioned uh, beefing up your CV, doing research, doing posters, uh, things of that sort to help put yourself in the best position to be able to um, get the right res residency opportunity. What types of, I guess, skills could, apart from those types of things, what types of skills can students work on um, before they hit the rotations in their third year 
uh, that they can practice and uh, especially with regards to surgery, like what are some of the skills that they can work on to put themselves in a position so that when, they're, when they get to that rotation, uh, they're ready to go, they know what to look for, um, and, and they know how to transition a lot faster? Well, you, know, you, you bring up some really good points. I'm going to just step back just a little bit to, to the part of what you were asking. Um, among the things we look at, and it needs to be in your personal statement, needs to be on your CV. How much volunteerism have you had? Are you willing to give back? And so I advise when I look over personal statements, and I see the CV where they've been aiding this and they've done the county stuff and they've done the health checks for old people, whatever. And I said, how come that's not in your personal statement? That you have a feeling of giving back, that you will continue this giving back as far as donating your, your time and your expertise. I want to know that because, you know, you're, you're going to be doing fine and everything. You're going to make a good living, but at the same time, you've know, been given an opportunity. So I want to see that need to get that. I also want to see leadership. I want to know that you're a good leader. I know. I want to know that you can communicate with people and get things done, whether it be, you know, an officer in the organization or leadership as far as organizing something, then that becomes important. I want you to be a team player. That becomes important. How do I know you're a team player? Your accomplishments and how you work with everyone else. I have the, well, over the years, I always had the residents sitting in on interviews. Why? You're the one that's going to turn over the knife to them, doctor. Why are you having us do this? Because you have to get along with this person. If you guys have a conflict and you can't work together, you know, my patients are going to suffer. You're going to screw each other, be pissed at each other to the point where you're going to sacrifice patient care. So, yes, you're involved. If you don't like that particular person, you don't think you can work with them, then it's, it's not going to work for me. So, being a team player and being able, able to express that is a team player. All right, so now we're going to go off into our rotations and whatnot want to impress the surgeon and convince them to write us a beautiful letter of recommendation, how wonderful they are. Well, I alluded it to you before. I had very few of my students and whatnot, and even my residents up to recently never read any of my papers. And I said, and I start, you know, I, I pip them all the time because we did a lot of original research. I did some of the original research on microfibrillar collagen and hemostat, in which I had grant money that basically went, I paid you know, the residents extra because they were going to So be up on what that person has done. You know, invest the time to go online and pull up their papers and pull up their CV and see what they've done. So you can be knowledgeable. You know, that's, that's their, that's, that's their ego too. And you are gonna to have to play to their ego. You have to play to their ego as well in many other aspects is, is being prepared. You have to be up with your patients. And that's why I always beat my trainers into the hospital to make the rounds first. They have all the lab stuff, and you guys can do this from home because you go online and you get all the patients' lab, you can look at their x-rays, CTs, everything at home. I had to run to the hospital early and, you know, go down x-ray and dig out the x-rays and find them, dig out the lab and whatnot. In fact, years ago, we, as an intern, we had to do some of the lab ourselves. So, you know, being prepared when you make rounds to have all the information about that patient. To have gone in and examined them. 
to know, to look over the nurse's notes, to know what's happened to that patient for the last 12 hours. Now the surgery schedule for me. You know you're going to be on such and such case. You have the opportunity I never had. You go to YouTube and you can watch any surgery you want. And you can watch it done by two or three different individuals and be prepared when you walk in that operating room and know what anatomy you have to know and know what physiology you have to know. So you can one-upsmanship. That's what happens is they'll have the resident across the table and they'll ask them a question and the resident him and haw. And you're sitting there thinking, oh God, please ask me. And once in a while they'll turn to you and say, well, don't feel bad, but do you know the answer? You don't, the resident is gonna be upset with you, right? So you can be a little hesitant. Well, I think, and you kind of give it a little, you know, chop a little piece off of it, I think. And uh, that's being prepared. Now, nowadays, we can talk about a surgery. I can talk you through this, et cetera. But what you have the advantage is between the simulators that are out, laparoscopic simulators, the endoscopic simulators, the robotic simulators, and all programs have to have these now to train you. You can go play on, I mean, I didn't even have Nintendo when I was a kid. You guys are great with your eye-hand coordination because you've been working off the TV for years as far as playing these games. And that's where medicine is now. When the robotic surgery is taking over so many areas, half the articles I'm reading, I just read one on uh, robotic um, thymectomy going through the chest robotically and removing the thymus for a myasthenia gravis patient. And man, wow, that's pretty cool. But you know, they can practice up on these things. Then, and then, you know, you're in surgery, you learn all that technique, you get a chance to do it. So now I can videotape you doing it. And we can sit down and be a Monday morning quarterback and say, well, you may waste the move here you could have done this a little differently. So you've got all this technology to help. So, you know, when you're a student, if you can get into those labs, into those simulation labs, guys, get in there. Learn your ultrasound, because you're going to use it at bedside. You're going to have it instead of a stethoscope in the future, looking at those heart valves. And the new ones, of course, are hooked to your phone. You don't even have to carry but only the transducer. So you can go ahead and check all these patients all the time. And what's happening now is the new chips that they're putting in. I don't know where this came from. Good thing you don't have to share screens here. And all this crap popping up. Pop up. So now, you know, you can practice all these skills and, and get ready for these things and be prepared. Look at the old event. So as far as developing your skills, if you grab that ultrasound, get into the simulation labs, and that can hone your skills. Put in the extra time. You're not on a 80 hour week like the residents are in your sure. Okay? Use it wisely. Oh, and sometimes uh, Somebody will spot you. There's life after residency. <laughs> good to know. <laughs> yeah, life know. after residency. The only, thing I I, the only thing I didn't do, my kids got to do, of course. I didn't start playing golf till I was 65. They were at the country club playing golf and getting lessons in. And somebody said, well, I thought doctors, all doctors play golf on Wednesday afternoon. And I said, most of them do, and I get their business <laughs> because they're not around. Yep. <laughs> so I was busy on Wednesday afternoons. <laughs> That's a good transition to a question that we wanted to ask you. Um, how did you balance your work life relationship? And I know as a surgeon, it's kind of, we hear that it's a very hectic schedule, tons of hours. How did you manage that? 
it's it you know it, it it's uh it is a balancing act it is it is tough and of course my 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 family goes through generations so to speak in which the oldest ones of course had my toughest years of residency and so on and the youngest ones had the best years of country club and mm -hmm. And the personality between the oldest and the youngest is like night and day. Plus, I think part of it. Uh, I try to get home every night for dinner, at least to be with them. Uh, I may have to run back to the hospital and do another case or so. But I tried to have at least one time. Of course, then we didn't have cell phones. And so there wasn't any problem at the table. And, uh, the television was in the other room, and so you got to communicate, ask how their day was. Yeah, I I missed I missed uh, I missed a few soccer games. I missed a few swim meets uh, that they had. There was somewhat understanding. Got one that was foolish enough to become a doctor. Also, she's the oldest daughter in practice in Michigan. But uh, I had six kids, and that's only one out of six. And the youngest boy, you know, I asked him, uh, well, you know, what do you think you want to do? He was a pretty smart kid, really smart. President of the class, and you know, student council and jazz. And uh, I said, yeah, are you interested in medicine? I'm going to be a lawyer. Said, what? Yeah, I'm going to be a lawyer. Well, how did you decide that you want to be a lawyer? He says, well, the family across the, the pond here, that's, that's the Brick family. He's a lawyer. Um, you know, kids get up in the morning, he's there for breakfast. And he's there late in the afternoon and he doesn't miss anything. Dad, he makes as much as you do. <laughs> Not more. I'm going to be the lawyer. I don't like your hours. They're terrible. And uh, I think you have to work much harder than he does to end up. He didn't have the feel for it anymore. You know, it wasn't, you know, we all, the reason we get into this business is we have a need to be needed. And the more we're needed and the better we do, the better we feel. And that's the thing that, that makes us run, so to speak, and want to do this. Uh, he didn't have that anymore. You know, he, he was cold hearted and still is. <laughs> is he a lawyer? He's a lawyer, and uh, believe me, he's a multimillionaire too. That's good. <laughs> so, in fact, he just—I noticed on uh, LinkedIn that he just started another company. I have to call and find out what this company does. <laughs> but he's done very well. He's—he's he's a hustler, but he's an A personality. But it is tough to balance. Um, and you have to try to make time. It wasn't until I started getting all these partners that I could find time to make time. And that's why the younger ones had a marked advantage because I could take more vacation, go on more ski trips, go on more fishing trips, we could take the boys up to Canada and you know, go fishing up there, and the girls would go to Kansas City and shop and buy things and go to museums, and they did their thing, we did our thing. So it, it was easier once I got a whole bunch of partners. You know, there's always problems with partners too. You know, it's hard to be the glue. A little bit easier for me because they were all former students. So, uh, you know, hey, we'll pull this on them. Mm -hmm. That kind of stuff. And so, but it is, it, it, it's, it's a very difficult, it's the stress you put on your spouses the demands, the asking for the understanding that you have to have. Uh, you need to follow the three C's in your marriages. You have to have communication, cooperation, and compromise. You have to know how to do that. And you, you have to really know how to listen. You know, we have to listen to our patients. But you have to listen to the rest of the family and the spouses and give them the opportunity to talk. You know, the kids said after I stopped doing surgery, Dad, 
you became a really nice guy. You really mellowed out. Well, the stress, don't realize you got that stress all the time and how they see it versus how you see it. And I said, well, I guess you're right. You're not under that stress anymore. I don't have somebody's life in my hands anymore. Mm -hmm. So um, going off of that, um, what, is there a particular type of personality that goes into surgery or is that, is that not a thing? Like, I mean, I know no one's really prepared for the intensity and the, the hours. I think that's just, you know, you, you learn that as you're in it, but is there a particular type of personality uh, for the job? Let me start out by saying, don't go into surgery unless you have a passionate love and desire. Do not wish to do anything else in your life. Because of the demands. So that's that's the first ingredient. It has to be there. I have had doctor friends that have pushed their kids into medicine. One very close friend who taught me orthopedic surgery had me sit down when he was done and talk about medicine, blah blah blah, and convinced this kid to go to medical school. He went, finished, finished. been two years he committed suicide. Not the end. Okay. So you can kill yourself being in the wrong field, being in the wrong area, being unhappy with what you're doing. And that's number one. Number two, I guess, is you really have to figure that you're going to be someone that has to be really special. And unfortunately, we get a lot of A personalities, right or wrongly, in surgery. We do have some problems. I have an ego as big as anyone. One student told me that the, the only hat I could wear was the Astrodome. <laughs> and my head was that big. And I said, you're probably right. But at the same time, you back it up with producing. And uh, I can't stress communication to you. You know, how you can listen, how you can learn, how you can see, how you can observe, and then how you communicate. I guess I can give you another story if you want. Let's hear it. Yes, as well. My father's a Catholic, a Catholic Sicilian, Italian. My mother was Jewish. Well, I had to keep both happy. So I was baptized in Bar Mitzvah by his own health. <laughs> but I'm working out a way because I'm a good kid. I'll study. And so all I do this Hebrew school thing. You have to learn how to read backwards and all this crazy looking stuff. I'm really working my butt off. Going to regular school, and then going to Hebrew school. So this big birthday's coming up just before the bar mitzvah, and I want a bicycle and a horse. I have a bike. I'm really, in it, but, oh. I know you got to be careful how you ask dad about things. Dad, you know, oh boy, this is a big birthday. Uh, I sure hope I get some special. What do you think? Uh, Guys might want to give me. Oh, oh, I got a gift for you. I got the best gift in the world. Really? Can you tell me? I'm excited. It's like, I can see the Christmas time with a BB gun, rifle, or a lot. Just you know, it's gotta be fun. It's gotta be fun. I'm gonna let you work for me in the shoes. I use it. Oh, sorry, I'm just too fat. I'm gonna let you uh, work for me. And Tom McCann selling shoes. He was a manager. I'm thinking there, we got to be careful, Norm. If you say the wrong thing, he's going to crack you in the head for sure. I said, yeah, Dad, that's, oh, man, that, that sounds great. But I'm, I, I don't quite understand. The son, 
There's all sorts of material things you can get. What I'm going to give you is the ability to learn how to communicate with all walks of life. People that speak different languages and have different religions. The ability to try to understand and hear what they're saying. And have that ability to last the rest of your life. Who the hell knows at 12 years old what the hell he's talking about? <laughs> Right. Yeah. Absolutely. So you have to learn how to have that communication, which led to teaching and everything else. Just those experiences. The teacher, as you've seen, not only is the entertainer, he's got to be charismatic and he's got to sell the product. He's got to be the salesman. You guys know I sell my product. Yep. I stimulate the enthusiasm in my product. That's why you leave with more. And that's what can make the, a great teacher. Back to the questions about personality, surgeons, that, you know, that there's a variety. Some of them I disliked tremendously because they were not nice people, uh, competitive. I always let my work speak for itself. I never undermine or say anything bad about anybody, but others do. I had to fight a lot of battles that way, including in the College of Surgeons. I was blackboard a couple of times, way back when they were blackboard, they didn't get in. So I'm going to change that. Worked my way up in the ranks and became president and threw out the goddamn set it up on points to be fair and not have somebody one person have the opportunity not give someone else the opportunity because that's the way some surgeons are they're the victim some surgeons are downright mean especially to their residents and it can be a real problem uh, some residency programs have been eliminated after inspection, after talking to residents and how mean the attendings were and they shut down the programs. Because they're out there. Hopefully you won't encounter too much. Hopefully you won't become that. Okay? Just remember where you are coming up in the ranks when you're talking to the people coming up in the ranks. You were there once. So treat them like you would have wanted to be treated. You know? And answer the question. Whole variety, guys. Full circle. I think I'm going to have the attitude of if I come across um, attendings that aren't very uh, exciting to work under, that there's something I can learn from their leadership style to make my leadership style better in the future. So just suck it up for the 12 weeks or however long it is with them, learn from it, and then help it improve my future whenever I'm teaching people later in my career. You know, you're going to learn from everybody. There's, there's things to learn from every surgeon, the things you can take away the good. You got to know how to leave behind the bad. Uh, and the same thing in their teaching techniques. Um, one trainer I had, as I said, was extremely meticulous. Uh, you didn't moved to the next step until all the field was dry. He was a perfectionist. He's the one that dropped the instrument. Real perfectionist. Prior to that time, he was a tailor. So you can imagine he had tailoring skills, sewing skills like nobody. Then I had another trainer that was like a bull in a china shop. I mean, God dang, oh man, I could tell you stories you wouldn't believe. But, uh, he was fast as hell. Uh, but he, woof. You know, he didn't care, you know, you know get, get, suck that blood out of the way, I'm working here, you know. <laughs> I guess, I guess if I had a, a difficult operation, I'd undergo the surgery by my trainer, because he was so meticulous. If I was in a car accident, I wanted that guy that was fast, mm -hmm. he'd probably get me off the table. <laughs> yep. So, you take away from everything and so I was able to increase the speed and, and find a happy place between those two major surgeons then there was the young surgeon that 
was hesitant and you learn not to be hesitant. And of course, you learn things from residents too and you have to tell them certain things. I have one resident, a really nice guy and everything, but he'd be operating and he said, oh shit, oh damn, or whatever. And I said, look, nobody would know that you screwed up if you didn't tell them. Well, keep your mouth shut and they probably won't know. I saw what you did wrong, but don't let your crew know this, they'll, they'll not have confidence in you. They'll fall apart and you lost your team. So, you know, there's, there's, there's ways to learn. Mm -hmm. You can take something away from everybody. You're, I haven't found it. I haven't, I'm with a group of guys here in North Carolina. We meet for coffee. About 13 of us. They're all old, old guys. <laughs> Boy, what background. You know, I got a general that, you know, flew combat missions with jets and ended up in commercial airlines. A Secret Service guy. Man, can he tell stories? So you're learning from everybody. And we're all, of course, very, very successful. The group I play golf with, the Golden Boys, I'm amazed at some of the backgrounds of these guys. You know, it's, it's fun to get a new partner and find out what they did. I'm learning, still learning. But I've still got my journal. I'm still learning. <laughs> you know what's I, interesting I, is that they probably are excited to hear your stories. Yeah, they 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 kind of pull one or two out of me every once in a while. <laughs> well, I got a lot of them. Somebody says you ought to write a book. I said, <laughs> I'm afraid that I get sued <laughs> by some of these doctors if I said what they did. <laughs> yep. So enough bad medicine over the years. <clears throat> I was on the board of medical examiners for the state of Iowa's combined board MDBO. So you know, you can see you see some bad surgery and have to take away some of the license. That was tough. Down in Florida, I probably would yank a lot more licenses than I ever did in Iowa. I had not, I'm not real impressed with some of the, some of the medicine I've seen, especially uh, when we do M&Ms, mortality, morbidity, and over these cases, I, I said, residents, uh, it's good that we're doing this so that we learn from experience and don't make the same mistakes. But really, uh, the problem, I try not to mean whatever surgeon screwed up so to speak at the same time you have to alert the residents what was done wrong so that they don't do that themselves. Lots to learn from everybody. Yeah absolutely so um I guess uh you know I guess one of our last questions that we wanted to ask was how do you find ways to keep your passion for medicine and teaching alive uh right now? You guys, you guys are my inspiration. I look at you guys and, and right now I'm looking at the diversity. You know, I started a PA program mainly down in Miami and had 50% uh, was English second language and I had 70% minority, which was, you know, that's a form of giving back to give them the opportunity. It's you guys that are my inspiration. It's medicine and the way it's changed and the great things that are happening that that are keeps my enthusiasm. Guys, it's lifelong learning. And you hear us saying this, and hear us saying this, and hear us saying this. But you gotta live it. Mm -hmm. I put aside two hours a day to study, read, read journal articles. Because I don't want to give you wrong information. I don't want to screw up and lead you down the wrong paths. So I have an obligation to you guys to try to stay on top of it. But I like it. I like to learn. I don't know about you. You know, right now it's a pain in the butt for you to learn, but I like to learn. I enjoy it. I've always enjoyed it. And but being able to learn and then communicate and work with guys. Oh, I, you know, every class is different. And so, I've had over 10,000 students over the years. 
I'm only on, I'm only on Facebook with a couple of thousand of them. <laughs> <laughs> but it, you know, it's, uh, you know, you're the future. You guys make me young. I'm 81 years old and I'm still doing as much as anybody else in the band. And like I said, as long as they keep on wanting me to come back, I will. Because if you, you know, I guess as a surgeon, I may have been lucky enough to say I saved a hundred lives. As a teacher, I've saved hundreds of thousands of lives. Mm -hmm. What bigger reward can you ask? That's true. That's a good point. Incredible. And uh, I know Dan had mentioned it earlier, but um, we are so lucky to have you as one of our teachers. You've been fantastic and, and uh, we've learned so much for, from you. And um, thank you for uh, teaching us and joining us today and, and uh, giving us all this incredible knowledge. We, we really, really appreciate it. My pleasure. I want to say thank you. Um, for the hard work that you've put in as a professor and also in your career of standing up for surgeons and osteopathic surgeons, you've made your work that you put in is going to make our life a little bit easier, even though it's going to be plenty hard, but it's going to be a little bit easier because of the hours and dedication that you put in. So thank you. That's the whole idea is that you have a much better than I do. Mm -hmm. That's what you're supposed to do, make it better for the rest. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. The Medical Muse is produced by Timothy Crow. Your hosts are Daniel Epstein and Raj Kabadi. Music on the show by Foxy Music. For more information, check out foxymusic.com. Join us next episode where we talk with world-renowned orthopedic surgeon and author, Dr. Alejandro Badia. Lastly, we'd love to connect with you. Follow our Instagram, the underscore medical underscore muse or on twitter at medical muse pod see you next time